Well, the focus that we're in right now, Beyond Us, it can be summed up in this way. We are going to the one who is beyond us, asking him to do something through us that's beyond us so that we can reach people that are beyond us. And that's our heartbeat. That's what we want to see happen. Lord, we acknowledge you, that you're in control, that you're almighty God, that you're beyond us. We ask for you to do something through us that would be beyond what we could ever accomplish on our own. And the whole reason we want to see it done, Lord, is we want to see people reached that are beyond us. And the best way that we can do it is together. And today, I want to encourage you with a part that you play. I want to encourage you with some ways on how you can get involved and how we do this as a family and how we're all in this together as a family. You're probably familiar with the sequoia trees out in California. These trees are mammoth. They um, can live up to 2,000 years. That's a really, really old tree. They can grow uh, to be up to 25 stories tall. I mean, you're talking trees that are as tall as buildings in downtown Columbia. These are big, big trees. Um, their bark can be anywhere, depending on the age of the tree, can be anywhere from one foot thick to three feet thick. I mean, three foot thick bark. That is a huge tree. They can weigh over 2.5 million pounds. But here's what's really fascinating about the size and the weight and the magnitude of those trees. They have a very shallow root system. And that's mind-blowing because you're thinking, how in the world can trees like that live for 2,000 years in earthquake area? How in the world can trees like that handle storms and elements for centuries and still stand? Well, here's something fascinating about sequoia trees. They live in groves. In other words, they don't live in isolation, they live in groves. So what happens is, is the root systems of all the trees in the grove intertwine with one another. Actually, they've discovered that even some of the big trees, that their root system covers about a four acre area. Intertwined together with one another, they don't do it alone. That is a great picture of what we do as a church that we do things together, we don't do it alone, that we're interwoven with one another. And today, we're going to study a very inspirational story that Paul uses. You can turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. But what's fascinating with what we're about to read is Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. Now, the church at Corinth had its own set of problems. Uh, Paul was uh, writing to them. He wrote twice to them uh, to fix some issues that they had going on. And one of the issues that they had growing, going on is that they just weren't being generous like they should be. And so Paul uses the Macedonian churches as an example of inspiration to share, hey guys, in Corinth, if you think you have it bad, and if you think life's hard for you, then you need to hear what's going on with the Macedonian churches and how they've worked together to do something that's beyond what you would have ever expected and beyond what you would have ever imagined. So join me in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to look at verses 1 through 5. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints." And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Now, this story of inspiration that from the Macedonian churches speaks to us about what generosity looks like and how generosity works. First of all, we need to understand this. Generosity is for everyone. Generosity is for everyone. We can get caught up in our minds, and the church at Corinth was struggling with this, since the church at Corinth was struggling with poverty, and they were struggling with not having the means that they thought they needed to give. Then Paul shows up and writes this example of the Macedonian churches, and he gives this beautiful picture that giving is for everyone. 
We often think that generosity is just for people that are well off. Well, I'll let the wealthy be the generous people or I'll let people who um, have great ability, I'll let them be the ones that are gonna be generous. But generosity must not be for me. And that's what the church at Corinth was thinking. Now, Jesus dealt with this issue as well. There's a great uh, teaching moment that Jesus used. One of the things I love about the way Jesus taught is he always took these great moments, these great teaching moments to teach his disciples. And they were at a service and it was time for giving. And the way that they gave back then is there was an offering box and People would come forward and put money in that offering box and Jesus and his disciples were watching what was going on. And what was happening was is the wealthy people were coming through and they were putting money in the offering box. And, and Jesus had this moment when it was all over to dialogue with his disciples. And he said, hey, did you see the wealthy come up? And they were giving out of their abundance. And the disciples would have, would have shaken their heads and said, yeah, we, we, we saw what happened. We, we saw what was going on. And then Jesus said, hey, did you see that widow? And they said, yeah, we did see that widow. And Jesus said, did you notice that she just put in two copper coins? That's all she put in. It's all that she had. It amounted to just a couple of pennies. It wasn't much at all. And Jesus said, do you realize she gave more than anybody else? Now the disciples would have been, oh, wait a minute. We saw the wealthy come through and put in some pretty big wads of money. So what do you mean that, that the widow came and gave more than anybody else? And, and Jesus said, well, she gave out, she gave everything she had. Everyone else gave out of their abundance while she gave out of what she didn't have. And she gave all that she had in trust in God. Now, you can imagine what a lesson that would have been for the disciples to realize that giving is for everyone. It's not for the wealthy to show off. It's not for one group that's better off gives because they're better off than another group. Giving is for everyone. And that's the beauty of the gospel. The gospel's for everyone. The opportunity to give for everyone is for everyone. And you can be a part. Second lesson in generosity that we learn from this passage is that generosity works in every season of life. A lot of you might be thinking right now, well, well how in the world could I be a giver? How could I be generous? Uh, because I'm in a season of life where things aren't going very well right now. I'm in a, a point in life where, where I just couldn't give very much and be very generous. But I want you to see what Paul goes to great lengths to communicate about the season of life of the churches in Macedonia. Look at this for a moment. First in verse 2, he writes, For in a severe test of affliction... Now, the reason why that's important, your, some of your translations say trial or, or test. This Greek word means to crush, press, squeeze. It means tribulation and affliction. It conveys the picture of something being crushed as from a great weight. In other words, what the churches in Macedonia were going through, it was not just a bad hair day. It was not just a bad day at work. They were in an overwhelming, crushing time of testing and persecution that was overwhelming. Then a second phrase that's used in verse 2, he uses the phrase extreme poverty. Some of your translations say deep poverty. This is actually two Greek words put together that mean this. It means rock bottom destitution. This word describes a beggar who has absolutely nothing and has no hope of getting anything. Now, let me read verse 2 because verse 2 throws us off a little bit. Let me read verse 2 with the real uh, expanse of the Greek language in this passage. Look at this. For in a severe test of being crushed, pressed, compressed, and squeezed, being crushed to the point from a great weight, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty and their rock bottom destitution at the time in their life where they're a beggar with absolutely nothing, with no hope of getting any, anything, has overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. This is a strange passage. Paul just said that they were in a terrible time of affliction, but then in the next breath, he said they had an abundance of joy. 
wait a minute. Wait a minute. Extreme affliction, crushed, pressed, overwhelmed, weighted down, but they had an abundance of joy. And then he just said that they were at rock bottom destitution and absolute poverty. But in the next breath, he said they gave out of an abundant, a wealth of generosity. You mean to tell me in the same sentence you can use poverty and wealth and in the same sentence you can use, you can use, uh, you can use trial and tribulation and then use joy? How can this be? Well, friends, what we discover in this, as we walk through this, what we discover is, is that generosity flows out of something much deeper than our wallets. It flows out of our hearts. And what's so interesting about this, it didn't matter what season of life they were in. And I want you to get this. Generosity is for everyone. Generosity works in every season of life. Now, the season of life that they're in, I thought it was interesting that he said that they gave according to their means. Every one of us in here have different means. You're at different seasons in life. Some people have more means. Some people have less means. But in the midst of the means that we have, he goes on and says, I can testify that they gave beyond their means. That they went over and above, even in a time of great difficulty and even in a time of great Poverty that they gave and they went over and above. It works. Generosity works in all seasons of life. Now, next Sunday on the 10th, we're going to have together a time together called Commitment Sunday. And we've been talking about this for weeks now. But what we're going to be asking of our church family is we're going to be asking of our church family to give over and above what we regularly give for a three-year period for the future expansion, for the growth that we're experiencing on, at our church so that we can reach more people with the gospel. Now, some people are going to be able to come and they're going to be able to indicate what they're going to give for three years and it's going to be out of their abundance. Some people have the ability to give out of an overflow of abundance that they've been blessed with much and they're able in return to give much. Now, other people, you're going to say, well, look, I'm going to be giving out of the means that I have in the situation that I'm in right now. And you're saying, how can I give? I don't have anything to give. And I want to ask you to think creatively. I want you to ask you to think creatively. Uh, for example, at previous churches I've served, I had someone at my last church that they gave an antique car. And because they gave an antique car, the church was able to realize tens of thousands of dollars off of an antique car. At my church in North Carolina, someone gave some commercial property and the church was able to recognize a large amount of money off of church property. For some of you, it might be a sacrifice that you have to make. I've heard from multiple stories of businessmen that travel frequently and have to eat out a lot, especially traveling salesmen, that instead of getting a, a, a soda or getting iced tea at a lunch, they get water. And I've had businessmen tell me that over a three-year period, they save three to $5,000 by drinking water instead of buying a $3 iced tea at a restaurant. You add that up over someone who travels four or five days a week, 52 weeks a year, 50 weeks a year, and they do that for three years, it makes a difference. Let me tell you what my family's done. Over the past couple of months, knowing this is coming, a couple of things we did. We cut cable and went to a streaming service and saved $50 a month cutting cable. We looked at our cell phone bill. I was so sick and tired of my bloated cell phone bill. So I looked at my cell phone bill and changed that bill and I found significant savings in my cell phone bill. Plus, we cut our Sirius XM radio out of a car. Friends, I want to tell you something. Just in trimming back, I've saved $100 a month for my family. Now, you talk about that over a year, that's $1,200. Over three years, that's $3,600. Now, look, we're going to give much more than that. But I want to tell you, just by thinking smart... By being creative, we can save significant amounts of money by just thinking wisely. It might be a cup of Starbucks you give up a few times a week, but those are the type of things that you can really think of and say, what can I do to be a part of it? And the beauty of what this scripture is teaching us, the beauty of it is that everyone can be a part of it. That's the beauty of it, that Everyone's a part of it. It works. Generosity works in every season of life. And thirdly, 
Generosity excels when God is first priority. Now, I know this is the third point, but I want to tell you, this is the most important part. And this gets into now how. How in the world did the churches at Macedonia pull off what they pulled off in the midst of their terrible circumstances in life? And here's what we discover in verse 5. Look at this. And this not as we expected. I mean, I love Paul's honestly. Look, I didn't expect the church of Macedonia to pull this off. I didn't expect that those churches would be able to do this, but they did beyond what I expected. But they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. There it is. If you're looking for a secret sauce, if you're looking for, hey, what's the magic pill for generosity? Here it is right here. They gave themselves first to the Lord. First to the Lord. You are not going to be uh, jazzed up, pumped up, and super excited about generosity until you are jazzed up, pumped up, and super excited about the will of God. You are not going to be, uh, have a heart for generosity until you have a heart to say, you know what, I have a heart for the things of the Lord and I'm going to give myself first and foremost to the Lord that that's my top priority, that's the most important thing and that's the first thing I'm going to do. I mean, think of what Jesus taught. Uh, Jesus taught in uh, Matthew 6, He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Summary. You get your life right with the Lord first, everything else falls into place. Jesus also said uh, that you're to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. We're not going to get everything else into place until we get our love of God into place. That's where it all starts. That's where it all begins is getting our heart in the right place. Oftentimes, uh, people get nervous uh, when a pastor starts preaching about finances and starts preaching about this issue of generosity. By the way, uh, if you're a guest with us today or if you just joined us for the past couple of weeks, uh, this is not the norm for us. We're in a season in the life of our church where we are talking about sacrificing and surrendering and giving uh, for the sake of us reaching more people for the gospel. By the way, I've been at Riverland Hills for uh, over two years now, going on two and a half years, and I've preached three times on giving in a two-year period. So this is not normal for us. This is not what we do. But here's why we do it. Here at Riverland Hills, we're going to talk about what God talks about. We're going to speak to what the Word of God speaks to. And God's Word very clearly speaks to this area of giving. Now, here's what blows me away about how God works and why it's so important for us to get our heart in the right place. Two weeks ago, when I started preaching on these giving sermons and started preaching on generosity, I go to staff meeting on Monday morning and staff tells me, uh, Pastor, out of the services yesterday, we had two people that prayed to receive Christ in the worship services. And I'm sitting there scratching my head. I just preached on stewardship. I just preached on generosity. And we had people come to Christ. Then that makes sense to me. Because you cannot talk about who Christ is. And you cannot talk about the gospel without talking about the generosity of who God is. You see, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That generosity is the gospel. That generosity and grace is what God's been about. That's who God is at his very core. And so therefore, if we're going to be Christ-like, that's who we become is we become generous because God's been generous with us. So we give of ourselves first and everything else falls into place. Fourth, we need to understand that generosity overflows with enthusiasm. Most of the time when you think about a preacher preaching on giving or generosity, you often think, oh, drudgery, or I don't want to hear that, or ah, does he have to talk about that? It makes me feel uncomfortable. But when you look at the pages of Scripture, here's what you'll discover. You will discover that every time generosity is mentioned, it's mentioned with joy. It's mentioned with enthusiasm. I mean, that's why this passage is so inspirational for us that the churches in Macedonia were at the worst place that they could be in life. 
What was happening, just a little backstory on what was going on with the churches in Macedonia. You remember back to Acts, the book of Acts, the, the church is flourishing, it's growing, it starts in Jerusalem. They start experiencing persecution and so people are scattered into other regions. And as they're scattered, oftentimes Christ followers were going into hostile areas people that didn't want to have anything to do with Christians. And so when you think of persecution, you also th- you all, often, if I can get that word out, uh, think of persecution in the area of like physical pain or some type of uh, persecution physically, which that did happen. But one of the ways that believers were persecuted was financial persecution. You got kicked out of Jerusalem. You end up in these other parts of the country. You go to a place that's hostile towards Christians and you try to sell your goods at the market. And they, everyone in town says, hey, don't buy from those people. They're Christ followers. Don't, don't buy anything from them. They say they follow Christ. Or you go to get a job in that town And someone looks at you and says, you're a Christ follower, aren't you? I'm not hiring you. You claim Jesus. I'm not hiring you. So one of the worst types of persecution that people faced was a financial persecution. That they had no means whatsoever to do anything. And what's fascinating to me is these people are in that environment, but yet we see phrases such as abundance of joy, overflowed with the wealth of generosity, begging. Did you catch verse 4? I mean, I want to make sure you got this. Verse 3 and 4. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, first of all, on their own accord. Nobody manipulated them. Nobody twisted their arms. Nobody stepped on their foot and said, you have to do this. They did it on their own accord. It was out of their own willingness. Then in verse 4, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in this ministry, which was the relief of the saints. Now, I've been in pastoral ministry now for two decades, and I want to tell you something that's never happened to me. I've never had someone come to me and say, Pastor, I beg you to pass the offering plate more. I beg you, Pastor, to give us more opportunities to give. Never happened. I've gotten hate mail before and bad emails for preaching on giving, but no one's ever said anything like, I can't wait for you to give us the opportunity to give more. You know what the churches in Macedonia did? They weren't middle class. They weren't sitting in a nice heated and air-conditioned building. They weren't in comfortable seats. They didn't even have beds to sleep in. And you know what they did? They overflowed with such enthusiasm towards giving that they said, God's given so much to me, i tell you what I'm going to do. Because God's given so much to me, I'm going to give back to him. And you don't have to twist my arm to do it. You don't have to manipulate me to do it. I just want to do it because I want to give as God's given to me. Paul uses the word in verse uh, 8, chapter, chap, chapter 8, verse 1. He talks about the grace of God. And then look at verse 7. In verse 7, and actually it's in 6 and 7, he calls it an act of grace. At the end of six, then in seven, but as you excel in everything, in faith and in speech and in knowledge and in all earnestness and in, the, and, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. So he, he equated giving with an act of grace. In other words, joy and generosity are twins. They, 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 they just are together. They're, they're like-minded. There's a likeness that's there with this issue of joy and generosity. I grew up going to Florida a lot. My dad was from Orlando. My grandmother lived in Orlando. And then when she retired, she moved to Melbourne, Florida. And um, I I was going down to Florida in all the years of the space shuttle. I grew up in those years with uh, the space shuttle being launched. And we used to drive as close as we could. And when the space shuttle was out, you could see it coming out of its hangar or you could see it um, out on its launch pad. Uh, My grandmother could sit in her backyard and see from a far distance, but she could see the, uh, the plume of smoke and the space shuttle black blasting off. And and so I was just always fascinated with that and just always thought it was so cool. And I never could figure out how you could get something that big off of a launch pad. And what does it take to get that off of the launch pad? And you know, all the videos of the, 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 the big, the big rocket and the booster rockets and all of the flames and heat and power that's coming out 
I want to tell you something. NASA didn't sit around and say, hey, boys, everybody go get your propane tanks off your grill and let's, uh, let's strap some propane tanks to this thing and I bet this will get it off the ground. Uh, no one was sitting around thinking that propane tanks were going to get that off the ground. It took a very specialized fuel to get that type of equipment and that type of weight off of its launch pad. And so I've always wondered, what's it going to take? What's the fuel that gets us off the launch pad of generosity? It's not going to be the, it's not going to be manipulation. That never works. It's not going to be guilt. That never works. That's not what God wants us to do anyways. So I refuse to stand up here and try to guilt or manipulate people because it's just not biblical. What is the biblical fuel that launches us into generosity? Well, it was already spoken to us in verse 5. But they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. I'll tell you what, you want to get off the launch pad in life in any area of life. You have some things you need to fix in your marriage, some areas of life, some bad habits that you're trying to correct and give up, and you need to get off the launch pad with that. Uh, you're trying to learn how to love the Lord more, and you're trying to learn how to live right. What is it to get us that direction? Well, Paul summed it up when he said, give yourself first to the Lord. That's the fuel. That's what's going to do it. And so, friends, I just ask you to seek the Lord I just ask you to cry out to the Lord. I, I want to challenge you in every area of life, not just this area of your wallet, to get your life in alignment with the Lord. And it is fascinating to me that we will pray a prayer and trust Jesus Christ for our place in heaven that we will come to him and that we'll admit our sins and we'll say, Father, I trust you. I trust what you've done through your son, Jesus Christ. And I trust you for my place in heaven. And I trust you for all of eternity. And I trust that you've prepared a place for me. It's fascinating to, that we will trust God for all of eternity, but we won't trust him with our wallet while we walk through this earth. It just doesn't make sense. If we say we're going to trust him, let's trust him. And where do I start? Well, I'm going to start by giving my life first to him. Maybe today you need to do what people have done in weeks past, and you need to ask Jesus Christ to be Lord of your life, and you need to surrender your life to him. Some of you came to church today, and maybe you didn't even recognize that you had a need for Christ, but today's the day of salvation for you. I want you to know that in just a moment at the end of this service, that we have people that are waiting for you in our next step area through the doors you came in and to your left. It may be you have questions about what it means to know Christ. It may be that you're just in a hard predicament in life right now and just need someone to pray with or talk with you. Uh, maybe you have questions about next steps here at Riverland Hills. Hey, how could I get involved? How could I become a part of this faith family? Um, what, what would be the next step for me to get on a mission trip or to find a life group? Uh, we've got folks that want to talk with you, and we don't want you to leave here today without being able to talk with someone. So at the end of this service, we invite you to join us in our next step area. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the inspiration that comes from the Macedonian churches. And I stand in awe that uh, those churches that took bold steps of faith, that uh, we are still talking about them thousands of years later. Thank you for the impact that they've made, and I pray that each one of us would first and foremost, what matters most today is that we would give ourselves first and foremost to you. So I pray that we'd be a people that surrender and a people that are obedient, and we know that when we do that, that everything else, including our finances, falls into place. So Lord, we trust you, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.